Good afternoon and welcome to the fourth in our 2021 webinar series delivered by Dr. Tim Sandor. These monthly webinars are covering different aspects of Annex 1. Hopefully they will help you prepare for when it goes live later this year. Today's topic will be clean room design and certification. Before we start the webinar, um, just a couple of housekeeping hints and tips. If you've got any technical issues, um, if you want to put a short message in the questions box on the right hand side of your screen, our team will look into it and try and resolve your issue as soon as possible. But please be aware we're working remotely, so sometimes there may be a delay in being able to help you. During the webinar, RSSL would like to invite you to ask questions, also using the question box on the right hand side. At the end of the webinar, um, time permitting, we will try to answer as many of these as possible. Any that we don't get round to, uh, we will answer offline and share them with you, along with a copy of the slides from today and a link to the webinar if, you if you've had any difficulties watching it. So for those of you that haven't attended any of our webinars before, my name's Annette Russell and I'm the Sterile Manufacturing Lead at RSSL. Um, if you've attend, um, I work in the commercial team here at RSSL and I work directly with our pharmaceutical microbiology team to support our clients in, who are involved in both sterile and non-sterile manufacturing. If you haven't attended any of our webinars before, um, I recommend you go to our website as there is a whole series of webinars that we did last year during the height of COVID. And we've done the three um, earlier this year in this series. All are very uh, informative and Tim has kindly delivered them all for us. If you're interested in any of the services that RSSL can offer, um, to support you and your team, please do get in touch with me via the contact details that you can see on the slide in front of you. This webinar, I'm continuing with the, the Meet the Team theme that um, we carried over from uh, the last couple of webinars. And today I'd like to introduce you to Jamie Tempest. Jamie is our sterile sterility supervisor and environmental monitoring consultant and has worked at RSSL for seven years. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you for joining me. Hi, Annette. Hi. So, Jamie, can you give us a brief overview of what your role within the pharmaceutical microbiology team is? Yeah, sure. So, primarily, I manage a team of technicians and analysts that perform our sterility testing and the related tasks here at RSSL. Um, but as you mentioned, in addition to that, I'm also the environmental monitoring consultant which include things like for our clients, such as general troubleshooting, um, writing and guiding clients with risk assessments or things like contamination control strategies. But the consultancy role actually extends outside of environmental monitoring. It's just any general microbiological issues any of our clients are having, um, I can come to site and, and help you resolve. Excellent. So what, what does a normal week look like for you at RSSL? I, I'm not sure I ever have a normal week here, but uh, it's part of the reason I like it. So, as I said, the main part of my job, which I suppose remains reasonably constant, is the management of my team. So, things like um, scheduling routine testing, validations with my analysts, um, reviewing things like documentation, releasing surveys to our clients once we've finished the analysis. Um, these days, it's quite rare that I actually do any sterility testing, um, but I do still like to get involved in the validations as much as I can. And I especially like the trickier, non-routine sample type validations. Um, but depending on what time of year it is, uh, some of my weeks I'll, I'll be on client sites doing some of the consultancy work, or I'll also be giving some of the training courses that are sell offer, such as the QP microbiology or the training course with Andy Martin. Okay, excellent. So um, our sterility suite is, is relatively new now. I mean, it, we've had it up and running for um, over a year. And you helped set that up at RSSL. What was the most challenging aspect you found of getting it to completion and certified? So this is, this is uh, uh, probably not one people are expecting, but 
the most challenging part wasn't the design or the MHRA approvals. It was getting a build across the line in time for everything we needed to do. Um, yeah, because obviously we have to put the MHRA months in advance. So even with the slippage we built into the project, it was still cut down to the wire. So yeah, that was that was definitely the most stressful and challenging part was uh, dealing with all the contractors and everything for the clean room build. Right. Um, and it was it was actually it was kind of a relief to be in a regulatory audit at the end of it, to be honest. So that was the that was the <laughs> easy part. Well, that's good to know. Um, and as I mentioned, do you provide the environmental monitoring consultation to our clients? What element of that side of your role do you enjoy the most? Um, there's there's probably two things to be honest that uh, I enjoy, enjoy. So one of it's the problem solving. So I get called out a lot when either their team of microbiologists or they don't necessarily, if it's non-sterile, they might not have a dedicated microbiologist on site, and they call me out because they've had a problem, um, looking at a specification result, and they they can't find the root cause. So being able to go to the site and um, basically help them through that. Um, investigation and then coming to a probable root cause at the end and helping to eliminate that as a contamination um, event is quite satisfying and mm -hmm. the other side of it the second part is obviously I, I go as a consultant to site so I like to not only just do the work that I, I'm they're paying me to go for there to do but it's also giving them some technical knowledge of why I'm doing it how I'm doing it why I'm asking them to do this this way, so they have a thorough understanding. And yeah, I enjoy leaving people with more knowledge. Okay, excellent. And and finally, um, what what do you like to do for downtime when you're not running our sterility oh. suite or, or environmental monitoring consultancy? So there's two things that take up most of my time. So I actually run my own photography business, um, where I specialise in animal portraiture. Um, yeah, so that takes up a large proportion of my time, and then the other is my dog. So I've got a retired service German Shepherd, and in between all the expensive physio and vet visits, uh, yeah, I like to take him on a walk, and he loves to be worked. So I love training and teaching him new things because he really enjoys it. That sounds sounds like fun. Well, well, thanks for your time, Jamie. Um, and uh, uh, thank you. We'll, we'll I'll let you know. Um, we'll be in touch with people. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. So as I mentioned, um, I work with the, in, the the microbiology team here at RSSL. And within that team, we do a lot of um, support for our clients, as well as the environmental monitoring that Jamie has mentioned. We can also identify any isolates that you may have um, that you may have come in off of your contaminant plates. Um, we can help with cleaning validations, be they chemical or microbial. And we can also provide the disinfectant validation data of your cleaning products used in any of the cleaning regimes you may use in your clean rooms. Um, Annex 1 talks a lot about single-use plastics, and we can help with any e &L profiling of those. And as our core business supports raw material testing across the whole of the pharma industry. Um, so this includes uh, pharmacopoeial methods, but also non-pharmacopoeial methods that might be important to our biopharma sector. Um, we mustn't forget that you need to look at those stoppers and vials that are important in sterile manufacturing. And we have had a recent interview by Rizwan Chowdhury on our YouTube channel that you may want to listen into about how we go about doing that. Uh, finally, uh, we have a, a training team here at RSSL. So it, as Jamie mentioned, uh, he helps provide the training for our, one of our QP modules, and we can help with any um, training uh, requirements that you have. And I believe Tim is delivering one of our training courses on the 12th of October um, around pharmaceutical contamination control. If you're interested in any of these, please feel free to contact me. I have so Tim, I'm sure many of you have heard and subscribed to his many publications. Tim has over 25 years experience of microbiological research and biopharmaceutical processing. 
Tim is a member of several editorial boards and has written over 600 book chapters, peer-reviewed papers and technical articles relating to microbiology. Tim works for a pharmaceutical manufacturer in the UK and also finds time to be a visiting tutor at both the University of Manchester and UCL. So I will now hand you over to Tim. Hey, brilliant. Well, it's a great pleasure to be um, back with you again. And um, this is what we're going to be covering over the next 40 minutes or so. Um, so we're going to have a look at contamination sources and then putting that into the context of clean rooms and contamination control. And the primary focus is going to be with air, both as a a vector for contamination and the solution to contamination. We'll be looking at the four key principles of clean room design, which is air filtration, air dilution, air direction, and air movement. And then we're going to move on to clean room certification and we're going to have a look at uh, principally um, the ISO standard 14644 parts one and two. And this is all relating to the uh, December 2015 update to the standard. And then we'll just wind up with um, looking at some other measures for um, good clean room control and good clean room practices. Okay, so despite good design of clean rooms, and even if we are following all of the available guidances, it remains that clean rooms are always at a degree of risk from contamination. And there are um, several sources of contamination. And uh, most literature suggests that people in clean environments are the greatest contributors to contamination. Um, but we also have a degree of risk from water, because that's the main ingredient in many pharmaceuticals, and water acts as a vector and also as a medium for allowing some microorganisms to survive and to replicate. Air. Well, the air contains dust, things shed from people, rafts of particles that may, may be carrying microorganisms plus condensates and gases. And also we have the risk of transferring items into the clean room. And the percentages on the slide are again, an assessment of um, various uh, studies. And it always remains that people are the biggest source and generally provided people are practicing good hand sanitization, it's air dispersal that represents a key risk factor. Okay, so to begin with um, clean rooms and why they're important, um, just to uh, bring everyone up to uh, speed, so apologies if you're familiar with this, but the um, pharmaceutical manufacturing environment is based around a series of rooms that have specially controlled environments, and we use this word clean room. And the definition of the clean room is that the level of cleanliness is controlled and that's defined by air. So the strict definition of the clean room is the concentration of airborne particulates. And we have a number of control measures that we'll be looking at that allow us to reach this particular state. Um, so if we then consider um, the outside. So if we take the outside environment, and obviously it depends whether we're in a, a city, we're near a factory, we're, whether we're in the countryside, but typically the air contains around 35 million particles per cubic meter. In a grade B clean room, we're seeking particulate levels hundreds of thousands of times less than that. So we need to exclude those particles from entering the clean room. We also want, when particles are generated within the room, for them not to settle, particularly in critical places, and we want those particles to be driven out the room fairly rapidly. So we achieve that through these four key principles, and we need to bear these in mind in particular when we're considering the control of airborne microorganisms in clean rooms. So we have filtration, dilution, direction, and air movement, and we'll have a look at each one of those in turn. So if we consider air filtration, first of all, 
So filtration is important because it removes particles and microorganisms, and most microorganisms are attached to other matter. And this is done using HEPA filters. And HEPA filter is an acronym for high efficiency particulate air. And there are various HEPA filters in various walks of life. And if, if you have a, um, a Dyson vacuum cleaner, to pick one example, that has a HEPA filter in it. But the, the key thing about HEPA filters is that there is a, a standard, there's an ISO standard, and there's a European standard, and there are different classes of HEPA filters. And using the European standard, which is EN 1822, the highest specification of HEPA filter is the H14 filter. And this is what is used in aseptic areas and most other clean rooms, although some clean rooms have H13 filters, which is the grade just below. The H14 filter is designed to remove 99.97% of particles from the air, and that's particles of a size of 0.3 microns or greater. Now, because HEPA filters have a finite life, they're protected from blockages through the exclusion of larger particles by having pre-filters. So the idea of the pre-filter is that it will remove around 90% of the particles from the air. And HEPA filters are certified by their efficiency rating, which applies to the medium that undertakes the filtration. But in order to assess a HEPA filter for suitability, the degree of particle release needs to be expanded to include the integrity of the whole assembly of the filter and the ductwork. So there'd be a concern for any leakages around the edges of the filter as well. So if the assembly is not uh, fitted tightly into the ceiling, for example. And this is assessed through what's commonly called the DOP test, which is a throwback to the um, original substance that was designed to provide an aerosol challenge. But essentially, a particle challenge is provided to the filters, and the filters must not leak more than 0.01%. And in terms of how we're controlling the, the challenges, so if we again we consider, say, the outside air, has three times 10 to the power of eight particles per cubic meter, and we have a pre-filter, then we can reduce that down to three times 10 to the seven to the challenge to the HEPA filter, and then the HEPA filter then will reduce that down even further. So we're having a low particulate challenge coming into the room. Um, it also stands that it's fairly common within pharmaceutical facilities, or not, not exclusive, that the uh, air handling system recirculates around 80% of the air supplied to the clean rooms. So that actually means that the challenge to the HEPA filters is far lower than would necessarily be seen if we were bringing air directly from outside. So where we have that in place, the challenge to the room based on the filter efficiency and the, and the thing is probably in the region of around 100 to 300 particles per cubic meter uh, of a 0.5 micron size. And um, on the screen now is a diagram of a HVAC setup. So we have the HEPA filter in the center and then we have uh, gaskets securing that and good quality seals around that. Um, and it's very important that that overall setup is um, leak free. So we might have a good HEPA filter, but it's no good if we're having leaks either side. And then you can see with the green bar, that's designed to show where the particle challenge is fed up and then through the HEPA filter and how the efficiency is measured. So that's the first uh, clean room factor. The second factor is dilution. So where we have enclosed spaces, let's say with no ventilation whatsoever, then particles easily build up. And we've known this for 
hundreds of years. So, for example, one of the reasons why tuberculosis um, spread so fast through parts of Europe was because houses were packed tight into each other and contamination easily spread. So we know conversely that ventilation is an effective way at reducing contamination and we've seen that recently in the press around the uh, coronavirus situation as well. So with the principle of ventilation this is the process by which any particles generated inside a clean room together with any particles that might pass through the HEPA filter are carried away by dilution with clean air coming in. So this is the ventilation rate and it's expressed as air changes per hour. And Annex 1 used to state a target for clean rooms at 20 air changes per hour. That has now gone and with the new Annex 1 it's about assessing what the appropriate um, air changes per hour should be. So this is kind of fitting with thinking that something like a changing room where there's a high particulate generation as people get changed should have a far higher air change rate, say 75 air changes per hour for example. And to put the air changes into context, if you consider um, a standard office for example, then that might have two to three air changes per hour. Whereas with the 20 air changes per hour, that means that every three minutes, the entire room volume of air is replaced with clean air. So we've got this continuous replacement of air. So we're driving any particles out of the clean room. Now, air changes per hour is not a real measure, but it's something that's calculated based on air velocity um, measurements and room sizes and uh, a device called a bolometer is the standard way to assess that. So if you see people come into certified clean rooms that have a very large sort of half balloon like structure to do that. And the incoming velocity is measured in units of length divided by units of time. So it might be meters per hour, for example. And then the velocity is then also assessed by the entry ducts, the size of the room and the volume of the room over time. And this produces the measure of the air change rate. So it's a very important test that every time a clean room is certified that the air changes are tracked to make sure that they haven't dropped off from the previous one. Because if they do drop off, that might infer there's a, a blockage um, somewhere or the fans providing the rooms are not performing at the level that they should do. Another important factor related to dilution is this concept of um, cleanup time or what sometimes we called the recovery rate test. And this is listed as an optional test in the ISO standards, but I think it's something that should be considered. And in the new Annex 1, there's inference that this will become a mandatory test. So what the cleanup recovery test is doing, this is the time taken for a clean room to return to a set level of particles um, after it's been used for an activity. So generally what happens is that a level of particles is generated for the test uh, ideally going beyond the um, uh, limit for the room and then it's measured how quickly the room returns to a level of particulates that was there beforehand and, and at least to the accepted standard of the room and you measure that over time and the standard actually describes that being achieved in 15 to 20 minutes but in practice that's something that's normally achieved within one to two minutes for an effective clean room. Um, so the cleanup recovery times are important and the faster the clean room recovers, then the better the degree of control that we have. Um, another important concept is air direction. So if we imagine that we have a room full of 
clean air. Now, if we had free access to that room from a surrounding area containing uh, air of a lower standard, then um, there's a risk of the air from the lower standard entering our clean space. So we need to design clean rooms, particularly where we've got clean rooms of different grades or clean rooms interfacing with airlocks, so that the dirty air, for want of a better word, does not enter our cleaner area. And we do this by making sure that the pressure differential is higher in the cleaner area, so there's always a flow of air in the outward direction. So the way we do this is to have a very high rate of um, air supply into the cleaner room, so it then stands at a higher pressure to its surroundings. And we measure the directional airflow through pressure differentials. And we have in place um, then under the laws of physics that particles and microorganisms in a lower pressure area cannot swim upstream against a forward directional airflow. And we can strengthen this concept further by having airlocks over the access and exit doors into the higher grade clean rooms or first entry where changing rooms can act as airlocks. And this also, the airlock principle, helps additionally guard that higher pressure within our cleaner area is not lost too easily. So we can illustrate this um, pressure concept with a simple diagram. So the symbols on the slide where you've got the, the delta or the triangle symbol and the P, delta P is a representation in engineering of um, pressure differential. And the pale blue square is our cleanest area. The uh, next lighter blue square is the less clean area and the darker blue square is an area that's even less cleaner. So it could be that the center square is grade B, the lighter square is um, grade C, and the big surrounding square is grade D. And we want to make sure that we always have the air blowing in the direction shown by the arrow. So we have this pressure cascade, and this helps in terms of contamination control. Okay, and then the other principle is air movement. And we're trying to avoid contamination here, particularly contamination of product and equipment. And our big concern is where particles settle out of the air. And if they then land onto objects that we're trying to protect, like open vessels or open vials, for example, then we have a problem. So the most important principle here is that as long as particles and particles carrying microorganisms stay suspended in the air, they are less of a problem than those that settle out of the air and cause direct contamination. So this means that we need to control air movement. And there are two principles for the control of air movement. So in grade D, C and B clean rooms, we generally have turbulent airflow. So here, air is driven through grills or ducts at ceiling height, and it's removed through low level ducts. And depending on the supply velocity, we want to get the supply velocity right, is that the air then should remain in constant turbulence. And this helps to minimize the effect of particles and microorganisms from settling out. Now, of course, that's ideal because when we have objects in the room, we can have dead air. And also, the closer the air moves near an object, the slower air becomes and the greater chance of particle deposition there is. But the general principle of keeping things in turbulent movement does help with the contamination control strategy.
And then with grade A areas, we have unidirectional airflow, or what in the old days was called laminar airflow. And the idea of unidirectional airflow is that if air is supplied at a very high velocity, driven through specially designed grills, then it will flow for a reasonable distance at a desired velocity in a single direction. So the idea here, air, here idea here is that the unidirectional airflow blows away contamination and particles that come into its path. So we're trying to create a curtain of clean air where we're sweeping away uh, particles and microorganisms and trying to drive them away from depositing into vials. And um, this activity should be confirmed uh, periodically by airflow visualization or smoke study tests. And then these are recorded. And this gives us an idea of the degree of air protection that we have in place. Beyond air, there are some other factors that are important for clean room protection. So we need to make sure that the clean rooms are designed in such a way that the walls and floors are smooth and shaped to allow good cleaning and disinfection and avoid collection of dust. And if there ever is any damage, that's repaired as soon as practicable. And we want to avoid um, cracks and holes and to exposure of anything that might be behind um, the vinyl. And when we consider risks um, in relation to um, clean rooms, there are differences between uh, conventional clean rooms, RABs, which is restricted access barrier systems and isolators. So we will see different levels of contamination within these different systems. And where we have barrier systems as represented by RABs and isolators, we should see a considerable dropping off of microorganisms. And that's because going back to the one of the things is earlier with contamination sources is that if people are the primary source of contamination, then the barrier acts to exclude people from interacting with the grade A space. OK, so we're now going to move on to have a look at clean room standards. So there are various um, sources that we can turn to. There's information from um, FDA and we have the revision to Annex 1, which is the kind of theme around these um, webinars. Um, but they all tend to cross refer to the um, ISO series of standards. And there's the relatively new EN 17141, which is a European biocontamination control standard, which seeks to replace the ISO 14698 biocontamination standard, but due to various um, reasons, it stands as a European rather than an international standard. But for the purposes of this webinar, what's of immediate interest are the ISO 14644 standards, which generally refer to the physical parameters, including particle counts. And of greatest importance are part one, which sets the general standards for the classification of air cleanliness. And part two, which is about the specifications and the measurements for ongoing compliance within the clean room. So these two um, ISO standards were revised in 2015. This follows their original publication in 1991. Um, and it's important to make sure that you're using the current standard. And if you're um, contracting out to a clean room company, that that clean room company is using the current standard. And the version control around ISO standards is always with the, with the year. But it's important to note that these standards are multi-industry. So they're written for electronics, biotechnology, uh, different forms of healthcare, pharmaceuticals, and so on. So a degree of interpretation is required. And we always need to keep an eye on what Annex 1 is saying in terms of additional um, factors as well. So there's a whole series in general of um, ISO 
standard. So as I said, part one is about the classification. Part two is about the periodic testing. Part three is about the equipment that's used um, to assess um, clean rooms. And it looks at things like air velocity, air volume, air pressure differences, installed filter leakage, airflow visualization, cleanup studies, and with isolators contain, uh, containment leakage. Part four is for those who are seeking to purchase, specify, and design clean rooms. Part five is about um, general operations. It covers things like training, installation of equipment, and so forth. Um, part seven is about isolators, glove boxes, ramps, and so on. And then some of the other parts, the ones that are highlighted in green, are not really of relevance to pharmaceuticals. Uh, but part 14 is about the suitability of the equipment and whether that equipment is likely to generate particles, which is particularly important where there's any motors or fans that are um, based into that part of the system. So just a little bit of background about the ISO standards. Another important thing uh, when you're looking at these standards is that um, because they're not directly GMP, there's going to be variances in terms of particle sizes and particle cutoffs. So under FDA, the concern is with particles equal to or greater than 0.5 microns. Um, but under EU GMP, and particularly Annex 1, then for operations, the emphasis is upon particles of 0.5 microns and greater and 5 microns and greater. Now, the revision to Annex 1 is, as it stands at the moment, going to state that for classification, uh, for grade A, only 0.5 needs to be assessed, and there's the option to use larger particles if you so wish. But for routine operations, then both particle count sizes need to be continuously assessed. So the um, ISO standards um, give information in relation to the selection of particle counter locations for the qualification of clean rooms. And there was a change in between the revision of the standards. So uh, the first version of the ISO standards, the original 1999 one, had a formula where you would calculate the surface area of the clean room in square meters, then take the square root and it gives you a number and you pop in the particle count locations within that um, space. So you may end up with something resembling the diagram there. And you still need to generate uh, some kind of map to show the points of classification. And that's also useful for when you come to assess routine monitoring locations as well. So you can look at some variances um, for the levels of particles seen, but then you equally need to introduce a risk element as well. But the current way of assessing a uh, number of particle locations is based on a statistical approach called hypergeometric distribution. Um, and this comes in the form of a lookup table, so there's no need to do any statistics, but it's a approach based on particles within a clean room not conforming to normal distribution. So it uses a factor where there's a inbuilt confidence interval of 95%. Where, so what it's trying to get at is that when you monitor a clean room using the number of locations indicated in a table based on the size of the room, you will have a 95% level of confidence that 90% of the clean room complies with the intended standard depending on whether the results are satisfactory or not. So it allows each location to be treated independently. And um, it is a slightly more robust way of assessing the overall particle distribution 
within the clean room. So it contains a lookup table. Um, so you simply say, how big is the clean room in terms of square meters? And there is a number of locations given. And if the exact room size is not listed, then you select the next largest room size. Um, interestingly, this did lead to an increase in particle locations between the standards, um, but um, that does ensure a more robust review. Um, so just an example, um, there's uh, three clean rooms called ABC. It's not the grade, that's just a, a code. Three different room sizes, and you can see the 90, the previous version, the original version of the ISO standard and the revised standard. So you can see a 200 uh, square meter room would have had 15 locations uh, for particle classification that extended to 23 with the new standard. Now, once a number of locations has been selected, the room needs to be divided up into different sectors. Um, now, it's important that the user determines exactly where the particle counters are positioned. And within Annex 1, there's an additional statement that says additional particle count locations might be required, and these should be orientated towards the point of greatest risk. And it's that same philosophy that kicks in when routine particle counter locations are also considered. So we need to consider factors like room layout, equipment layout, maybe drawing on information from airflow patterns, look at the position of air supply and return vents, understand the air change rates, and also uh, where people might stand and where open product is exposed, and to also be mindful that we're not biasing the uh, monitoring in favor of areas that are more likely to pass. So that's kind of an area that can come under regulatory um, scrutiny. It's also important with the certification of clean rooms to assess the um, air volume and the, the approach that the standard is getting at is that the volume of air sampled needs to be sufficient to it to detect at least 20 particles of the largest size of particles selected. And there is a formula which is on the slide, which is a core part of the standard. Um, and there's an example that I've put on there, which is based on measuring the five micron size or greater particles in a grade C clean room in operation. And the outcome of this particular um, exercise would be that um, a minimum of one litre would be required in each location, but there's an extra clause within the ISO standard that says a minimum of two litres is in fact required in each location. And generally, the lower the particle count limit, then the greater the volume of air that needs to be sampled in each location. So a larger volume is taken in, say, a grade B clean room compared to a grade C clean room. So again, there's that criticality of clean room effect. So if we look at um, some examples, if we have three different grade B clean rooms on the slide, let's call them X, Y, and Z. Then for the classification, we'll assume we have a particle counter that counts at two liters per minute, which is a fairly standard type of particle counter. Um, so with the revision that took place to the ISO standards, um, they're actually led to a reduction in the amount of air that needs to be sampled per location. However, there's more locations that are required. So generally for a room of 200 square meters, um, 23 minutes of sampling would be required as part of that classification process. So the length of time that takes would depend on the number of available particle counters 
if the counters are recording at um, two litres per minute in any one location. Um, it's also important that with the previous standard, it was possible to add up all of the results from the individual particle locations and to compare those against the limit for the room, which would be the grade B or grade C or grade D limit. The standard now requires that every individual particle count location must pass. So on the slide there is an example from a grade B clean room using the 0.5 micron or greater particle size. And there's a conversion factor of 35.3, which is based on the use of a particle counter counting at one cubic foot per minute. And that conversion factor is such that there are 35.3 cubic feet to each cubic meter. So you do that conversion, comparing against the EU GMP grade B limit, which is 352,000 particles per cubic meter. And in this particular example, all six locations have passed. It's also important to make sure that the orientation of the particle counter probe is correct. So the probe must always be orientated into the airflow, uh, particularly for unidirectional air. So if we've got a horizontal or a vertical um, unidirectional airflow device, then we must orientate the probe in the right direction. And with Annex 1 revision, there's a strong emphasis upon um, assessing clean rooms with equipment running and the maximum numbers of personnel um, present. It's also important that the test certification is reviewed and a number of key factors are captured. And one thing that can sometimes happen is that the whole assessment of clean room parameters and the recertification falls in the hands of, say, an engineering department or a validation department. But it's very important that the microbiologist is aware of what the results are how it was done, what the readings are, because the whole purpose is with pharmaceutical manufacturing is with seeking microbial control and particulate control. So it's a very minimum for sort of GMP. We need to have the name and address of the testing organization, the date of testing, which ISO standard was used and the year of that publication, uh, where the clean room is, uh, why the locations are, so needs to be a supporting diagram, the class of the clean room, together with its EU GMP equivalent, the occupancy level, the particle count sizes considered, the test method used and any deviations, which the identification of the particle counter and verification of the particle counter was calibrated, and the actual test results as well. And that also extends to um, re certification. Another thing to watch out for though as well is that the ISO 14644 part 2 standard states that all clean rooms are assessed annually as a minimum but EU GMP says that for grade A and grade B this has to be done six monthly. So again the annex trumps the ISO standard. And also within X1, there's the reference that the information from the classification informs the routine monitoring as well. So just to uh, the last couple of slides, um, there's a couple of other things obviously that also contribute towards clean room control as well as, well as the design and the certification process. So cleaning and disinfection is vital to the maintenance of facilities. And we need to have well-designed facilities that can be cleaned and disinfected properly and we also need to make sure that we know the compatibility of our cleaning and disinfection agents against the clean room materials and that's an important part to play in disinfectant efficacy studies. We also need to undertake a high level of environmental monitoring. So importantly as we said before is that environmental monitoring is not a substitute 
for poor design or poor control, it should be the verification that our controls are working properly and that we're assessed setting appropriate levels and we're undertaking appropriate trending and analysis. Okay, so this brings the uh, main part of the webinar to an end. What we've um, covered is contamination sources. The way that clean rooms are designed to reduce contamination, so a well-functioning clean room has good air filtration, good air dilution, appropriate air direction and air movement. We then looked at the standards and what they're requiring for clean room certification and just rounded up with some of the other measures. And, and just the key point to, to make is that, you know, as my, anyone here is a microbiologist, make sure you're getting this information from your engineering department because it's critical for understanding contamination control. Okay, I'll pass back to Annette. Thanks, Tim. So um, we have had a few questions come in during the course of the, the talk. Um, if I run through a couple. So I've had a question from Kate. She said, for recirculatory systems, is there a standard makeup of air in terms of percentage? So for example, 80-20 or 90-10? Um, my understanding is that 80-20 uh, is the most uh, common, but it will vary depending upon the facility design and the age of the facility. But I think the generally the more air that you can circulate, then um, the lower the particle challenge that you're, you're putting back into the um, in, into the HEPA filters and help and that can help prolong the life of the of the HEPA filters. Okay, excellent. Um, and another question from Jane, how does good clean room design fit in with a contamination control strategy? Um, good clean room design is is really important and to actually be able to start from scratch now it, it, you're in a much better um, situation so you can start um, considering all of the different factors that, that need to be um, considered so the clean room is is of the right size, not 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 too large. You, you need to know how many people are going in there, what the size of the equipment, whether the equipment itself generates particles, what's the appropriate number of air change rates so the clean room can clean up that it's made from the right materials. Also, the degree of temperature and the humidity control that you need, because um, the um, if, if you look at um, some when you can get like clean room air modeling done, so this is using um, a process called computational fluid dynamics and you look at the different flows and slowdowns of the of the air in the clean room is that the temperature affects the uh, air movement as well so that's another factor to consider so these good design practices really can help bring contamination down the problem that a lot of people face is with the legacy facilities the older pharmaceutical plants that can't be as adjusted or adapted so easily Okay, um, and a question from Shaguta. How useful are smoke studies for clean rooms? Um, yeah, very, very useful for um, grade A and grade B. Um, now, as an aside, uh, the, the one of the ambiguities in the, in the latest Annex 1 draft is the inference that that would apply to C and D areas as well. I'm not sure that's what's meant and how useful that would be but certainly within the um, grade A and grade B it's it's very useful one as an operator training aid and two also for assessing the the first air principle which is within the grade A zone that nothing obstructs or gets in the way of the the airflow so you can you can assess how well the air is distributed and then for understanding the key risk factors around interventions setting up filling machines, um, moving environmental monitoring samples and so on, you know, using that to, to show that you do have this curtain of protection, you've got that fast downward flow of unidirectional air moving uh, around half a metre a second. Okay, um, I have one from Sajid about how do we assess whether a clean room surface is compatible with a disinfectant? Um, 
so that's also uh, quite fundamental to the Annex 1 revision. So there's there's a lot more in Annex 1 about cleaning and disinfection. And there's an emphasis there upon the surface or coupon studies uh, as, a, as opposed to just testing disinfectants in, in suspension or in solution. Um, so um, some surfaces can be damaged by disinfectants. Others can inactivate disinfectants and others require longer contact time. So the way you'd set the time that the disinfectant needs to be in contact with the surface is against the range of different surfaces. So you might find that a longer contact time is required for acrylic as opposed to glass or for stainless steel as opposed to vinyl. So um, establishing a matrix of the common surfaces and then examining those against the key disinfectants, which is a minimum would be the two rotational disinfectants that are used. And you can also then, as an aside, also assess whether there's any risk of residues or, or um, any longer term damage from some of the uh, more aggressive sporicides that are used. Okay, and a couple more questions. One from David. Lots of facilities are trying to save on energy. Does this impact? Does this impact on the operation of clean rooms? Yes. Yeah, you need to be very careful with um, energy. So, a lot of um, uh, engineers or um, operational excellence um, people will see energy saving as, as an efficiency, and it is. I mean, we have a we will have a duty to use less energy as as, as part of environmental stewardship, but we do need to be careful that it's not to the detriment of contamination control. So if, say, we want to reduce the number of air change rates, then um, one, that could be dependent upon individual clean rooms, and two, we would need to do that in a, in a very controlled way, maybe a little bit at a time. And, you know, we want to see what is the effect on particle distribution, what is the effect on clean up rates, is the environmental monitoring showing a shift? So, yeah, I think it's, you know, the right thing to do, but we need to do it in a very controlled and steady manner. And there will be a point beyond which we can't go uh, because the contamination risk will become too great. Okay. And the, the last question from Daniel is, how would you assess the impact of engineering works within an operational clean room? Um, yeah, that's quite important. So, um, I, ideally, you don't have engineering works in an operational clean room, but sometimes there's the need for that to happen. So, there should be a formal impact assessment um, against a procedure. Um, if we're talking about aseptic processing, then those engineers need to have undergone an aseptic process qualification, which is typically involvement in a in a media fill. If we're going to do something unusual like open panels and thereby exposing the clean room to areas of the clean room which are not normally exposed, um, then we may need to do additional measures in terms of particle counting and we may then wish to follow up with a sporicidal disinfection step. Um, and also we need to know in advance exactly what's being done, why it's done, what the relative risks are around that. So um, it can't just be a, a free-for-all activity. It's got to be controlled and, and supervised in some form. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for that, Tim. So that brings us to the end of the webinar for today. I hope you've all found it useful and we appreciate the questions you've asked. As I mentioned at the beginning, I will circulate a copy of the slides along with the questions that were asked um, within the next few days and a link to the, web, the webinar in case you had any difficulties um, watching it. So this was the fourth in our nine series of webinars. Our next one will be on the 28th of July covering people in clean rooms, the contamination risks, clothing and behaviour. And don't forget, if you're interested in Tim's course on developing a contamination control, control strategy on the 12th of October, please do get in contact with me or via our website.
So on behalf of RSSL, Sterile Manufacturing Team, I'd like to thank Tim again for continuing to deliver such informative webinars and for all you out there for listening today. Please do not hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or if you need any support with any of your projects. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.